How you are in the world matters. Overwhelm is inevitable and optional. It's time to listen up and make it optional for you. Hello, welcome to this week's episode of the Overwhelm is Optional podcast. So if you can hear a purr, it's because I'm recording this with the company of Chomsky. Welcome, Chomsky. Um, This week, I'm really excited about this topic. I've been thinking about it a lot, walking around the garden and just, yeah, just the words impossible and possible are really, really fascinating to me at the moment because arguably everything we do is previously impossible or a lot of the things we do that I guess that we see as progress in our lives was originally impossible so for example if we go back to being born like if if a baby was capable of thinking and predicting oh in a year's time I'm going to start walking that baby who isn't thinking that but, you know, that baby would be like, well, that's not possible. I don't even have got arms and legs. I mean, <laughs> that's a ridiculous example, I know. But my point is, when we think things are impossible, I think it's worth saying, but what if they're not? Because I really like this idea that if we really, really want something, but it feels impossible, maybe the just wanting of it means that actually it is possible, but we just need to deal with the minds weighing in on it. So this week, what if the impossible is possible and the possible is impossible? So yeah, I've introduced a double thing there. Let's see how it goes. So what if the impossible is possible and the possible is impossible? And I mean this very, very personally for you. So this isn't about anyone else. So I'm going to base it around my core premise, which is the idea that um, we can have meaningful, satisfying work and full health and good relationships. We can have it all, but we need to listen to the body and the heart, not just the mind. Because when we live in the mind, the mind will tell us we can't have it, it's impossible. So if what you want seems impossible, So you've been trying for a long, long time to work out how to keep the job or or change the job in such a way that um, it fits you and suits you or work, business or whatever you do. So it might not be employment. It's it's whatever is your your work, whatever, whatever it is that you that gives you purpose and satisfaction. So. For most of us, that's linked to money and living, which puts a whole other dimension in there because then we feel trapped, right? We have to do this work rather than I get to do this work in the world. So when we go back years and years, well, for me, it's years and years to school and we start all of this, you know, career stuff, what do you want to do? And and at that point, we have options. We might not feel like we have very many options and we most likely don't even really know what the options are because most jobs don't have titles and they're quite invisible. But there is this idea in our culture, isn't there, that you can grow up and and choose, have choice, particularly if you work really, really hard at school. And then we get later on and we've worked really, really hard and then we feel trapped like we don't have a choice. So something shifts there that's, that's important to pay attention to because what if we do have a choice but we can't feel it? And I think this is really important. I think often we have choices that we can't see, which is why the podcast is called Overwhelm is Optional, because to me, not realising that the overwhelm is optional means that your choices are narrowed considerably because the state of overwhelm, and I don't mean that temporary, oh, I feel really overwhelmed. I mean that getting really stuck, like I'm really overwhelmed. I can't see the wood for the trees. I just yeah, really cannot see any other way than to keep pushing myself or quit. That real serious overwhelm and even the momentary overwhelm is not great. So if we think of overwhelm as the mind getting completely overloaded, going into high alert state, which means that the nervous system goes into high alert, 
So the stress response is activated and that will shut down the prefrontal cortex, which means that we can't think, which is quite right, because it's not very helpful in an emergency to be sitting there going, oh, I wonder what I should do, because that's not that's not a survival instinct, is it? That's not going to save your life. But in normal everyday life, it's very, very easy for that stress response to get activated and to stay partially activated all the time so that we're in this reactionary mode and we can't think straight. So we're thinking, but we're kind of pushing ourselves to think through the overwhelm. So we're purposely activating the prefrontal cortex, but it's like it's painful because we've still got the hangover from the stress response, which is hanging around just in case, just in case, just in case, because many of the things in our day to day life activate the stress response from notifications, emails, you know, all sorts of stuff. I took a photo the other day of um, what was it? Oh, yeah, we were we were getting some coffee from an outside stall and I noticed this small warning sign in the middle of the menu. So it's, you know, one of those big menus at the side of a van. And it, there was this warning triangle and it said, warning, these drinks can be hot. And I took a photo of it because, you know what, I'm absolutely sick of warning signs. I'm sick of them. Like, of course, the drink's going to be hot. And and I'm sorry, but you you really we've really got to start taking a bit more personal responsibility because actually I'm not convinced that the warning sign was there. Because it was very, it was a high alert, alert warning sign. It wasn't a, oh, kindly be careful with your drinks. We're looking after you. It didn't feel like it came from kindness. Now, I could be wrong. It feels to me like businesses and large organisations put out warning signs to abdicate responsibility for any stupidity on our part. So if you burn yourself from a hot drink, oh, we warned you. Therefore, we're let off the hook which I get because being sued in business or in life is just horrible. So I get it, but I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the idea that we can be warned and protected from everything and that in doing so that enhances our life because it doesn't, it makes us miserable. The more we do to um, alert our minds, each other's minds into the stress response, the worse life gets. Because then we're behaving as if we're in actually in an emergency. And most of the time we're not. We're very, very, very fortunate. Um, I'm in England, obviously, from my (laughs) accent. I'm in England and we're not at war currently. I'm not being bombed. You know, I'm not in an earthquake zone. There's nothing emergency like the real, real big stuff that's going on in other parts of the world. We are fortunate and yet all day long the stress response is being alerted into high response and it's unhelpful and it makes us miserable and it's really, really bad for us because what's actually happening is in those glorious moments of history when we are actually safe, when we are warm and well fed and we have people around us who are safe as well, who we don't have to worry about in terms of going off to war, etc., you know, in those rare moments of history, we're still allowing our happiness, our security, our comfort, the joy of having that. You know, this country hasn't always been this peaceful. And you could argue it's not peaceful now. You can, but I'd argue, yes, but from a relative point of view, we are safe. And we should absorb that because our poor nervous systems need it so badly it's just no way to live so this is really important because recognizing how often your nervous system is being sent into an unhelpful evolutionary response so if you're not actually in mortal danger when your phone goes off then recognizing that can allow you to learn new skills, to take action, to prevent that happening and to soothe your nervous system, which gives you more ability to live more skillfully, uh, with more joy, with more health, with more energy, with more ease, with more time actually to do the things you love because we lose time when we get overwhelmed. We're not aware of 
what we're giving our time to. We, when we get overwhelmed, we go into reactive mode and we lose track of where we're giving away our time and energy and attention. And time, energy and attention are so, so precious because that's your life, right? So when we get stuck in overwhelm, we just we limit our options for living well. And when we're stuck in overwhelm, things that we really want can often seem impossible because we cannot see how possible, how to make them possible for us. So if like me, what you want is meaningful, satisfying work that contributes to um, the lifestyle that you want, you know, the most fun, easy, joyful, great experiences, whatever it is you want, the clothes, everything, the lifestyle that you want to have the best life you can have, that life. So that may or may not be connected to your work, but for most of us, it is. So if you want that meaningful, satisfying work, but you don't want it to take everything else so that actually you're not really getting to live that life that you work so hard to create, if it's destroying your health or just damaging your health in that kind of like getting more colds, getting unwellness, getting more sprains, more niggles in your body, not being able to sleep well, not really being able to switch off. That's really common. You know, we work really hard, we get stuck in our heads and we just get into, you know, kick ass at work mode. And it can be really, really hard to, to just let that go and go into you know, fun and ease and presence where we can actually hear the people we love speak rather than just only half hearing them, where we're not that much fun to be around because we're preoccupied or just too damn exhausted or really quite anxious because we've got stuck in that high alert state. So if work is taking that away from you, then I'm guessing that's not what you want. So that to me is health. And relationships. That's a whole package to me. I want all of it. I didn't work this hard to um, not have a life because everything's going to work. So there is a current narrative that says you work really hard and that requires that, um, sacrifice and that's just how it is. Hard work gives you success and that's just the way it is. And then after that, it kind of goes into, oh, but you'll be able to do that when you retire. And that's really sad to me. I never, ever wanted that. I actually never bought into it. So I spent my 20s thinking money was terrible, waste time because it would require such sacrifice. I wasn't willing to do to do the things to get the money. And, uh, and interestingly enough, I had this attitude that at the same time, money would not be the reason I wouldn't do anything. And I, I'm fascinated that I had this in my 20s and 30s. And then I seemed to lose it when I went into career mode. So I've been really, yeah, listening to that kind of remembering stories, chatter in my head about, hmm, so what part of me? And I did do amazing things. But how how did I lose that belief that money wouldn't stop me doing? It? I don't think I lost it completely, but I just find it interesting that um, I think I was more, it's probably age, isn't it? So I think in my 20s, I was probably kind of more fun, more kind of rebellious and like, yeah, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to let money be the reason I don't do something. Now, some people, I know people who, or I've, I've read about people who also have this attitude. So I'm fascinated. I don't know where it came from. I just feel like I was kind of born with it. It's, it's my innate rebelliousness. Um, but if you think about it logically, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's impossible because money, you need money to do things. And yeah, I did lots of things. So it's, I don't know. It's, it's a really interesting one. And it is very much linked to this impossible possible. These are these are labels we put on our external circumstances. That's impossible for me. It's impossible for me. Other people manage to do this job, cope and go home and in do all their life admin and, and have fun. But I can't because I've tried really hard and it's just not working. So it's impossible for me. I don't know how I don't know what else to do. That's that's definitely where I got. Although I don't I don't think I gave up. Well I kind of did. I started cutting my hours at work. So 
So I tried cutting my hours at work was one of the things I tried on my way to trying to make what seemed impossible possible because I loved my job. I loved working. It was so satisfying. Um, but it was just really bad for me. So it was this conundrum that went on for nine years until I burnt myself out and quit. And then the conundrum followed me because of course it does. It's a conundrum of my life. It's not going to go away just because I got rid of what I thought. I thought that would solve the problem. Quit and it'll all be over and then you'll be super healthy and blah, blah, blah. What a load of nonsense. I really want to look at this because well, it's fun. I love words and I love playing with words. And if this helps you see things differently and unlocks something that magically unlocks something that felt impossible and makes this glimmer of hope that is possible, then woohoo, my work here is done. So let's go for it. So if what you want seems impossible, i.e. meaningful, satisfying work, health, great relationships, you know, living fully, I'm going to argue that that word impossible is coming from the mind. So it's logically impossible because the demands of work are too high and it doesn't matter what I do. I, I rarely seem to have enough time and energy for the rest of my life. So it's impossible. I'd argue that that use of the word impossible is coming from the logical mind. That's a mind based argument. But what you really want, what you really want, that's coming from the heart. What will make you happy, what you long for, that ease, that ability to just feel at home in your life, just feel like it is all is fine. I can do that work and I can have my life. That's coming from the heart. That's information from the heart. And anyway, not having what you want is exhausting you. That's information from the body. The body's telling you something's off then maybe it's time to look at your impossible differently because you've got three things going on there. What you want seems impossible. Your mind's telling you it's impossible. It's not logically, it doesn't make sense, but your heart longs for it. You really, really want this. You don't want to quit your job. You work really hard for it. And you anyway, you have responsibilities and you would have to downsize your lifestyle and you actually don't want to do that either. So that's your heart. I want, I want to live. I want my life back. And also, you don't really have this is becoming urgent because it's affecting your body. Your body is sending you signals saying, hmm, this isn't working out here. Something's off. So that's information from the body. So basically, what I'm saying is if that's your impossible or something similar, then this episode's for you because we're going to look at how we make that impossible possible. Because actually the reverse doesn't work. So the reverse is, um, hang on, let me get this in my head again. The reverse is that you try and squish yourself into a life that doesn't work for you. That's the reverse. So either you pay attention, you notice that it, the that the limitations, this is impossible, is coming from the mind, that what you really want, what you long for, the energy, the ease, the satisfaction, that's coming from the heart. And that all the inconvenient niggles and the exhaustion, the inability to sleep is coming from the body and its useful information. The reverse of that is you listen to the mind and you go, okay, this is impossible. So I'm going to have to change. There's something wrong with me. You squish down the heart and go, yeah, not now. Not now. I'm going to I'm going to solve this. I'm not listening to you at the moment. I'm going to solve this using the mind. I'm going to do it logically. And you treat the body. Actually, you treat the body and the heart, the signals from the body and the heart, the what you really want and what's going wrong in the body. You use your mind to, to treat them as a problem. So something's off because I'm not happy. So logically, I need to do something. Something's wrong with my body that needs to be fixed. Now, that's that requires you changing yourself, either lowering what your heart wants. So maybe compromising on work or lifestyle. Normally, it's a compromise on um, enjoyment of life while maintaining work. So doing a good job at work, getting through and then 
crashing at home or being grumpy at home or postponing health and happiness. So not ever quite getting around to the things you want to do. So when you do that and then you you treat the body as, oh, I need to solve that. So I need to get an appointment with the physio. I need to have more massages. I need to eat better. I need to hack my sleep. I need to start meditating. I must do this. I must do that. I need to be better at this. Better, 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 better. So you're just adding to this invisible get better at list. So when we do that, your your mind, when your mind tells you that what you want is impossible, what your mind's actually saying is all of that effort is more possible than what you want. And I'd argue it's the other way around, that actually it doesn't matter what you do to change yourself. It doesn't matter how much you squish yourself into a life that isn't working for you. That is the impossible. That's what I'm arguing. It is impossible to feel at home in a life that you have set up with your mind logically. If it's not working for you, I mean, some people I don't know. I don't I don't know about people it works for because I don't work with those people. I'm only interested in you. So I'd argue that's harder and also fruitless. It's absolutely impossible. I don't know if that's completely true, but I'd argue it is. Why? I spent nine years trying to find a solution using my mind. Um, if you could hack it, I hacked it. I and I got really, really good at, I did improve, I hacked my sleep brilliantly. I hacked my productivity, I hacked my diet, my exercise, my time management, absolutely everything. I learned masses of useful stuff, still useful, but I would argue the fundamental problem was I was still, everything was mind-based. I didn't know how to listen to my heart. I didn't know the rich source of guidance in my heart. I didn't know how to treat my body. I didn't understand that when my body was telling me anything, actually. So you could say, well, an injury, you should pause and listen to that. That's ob- that's more obvious now. But I would say even things like um, rest when you're tired, stop pushing yourself. But there, there's this very hardcore, no, come on, keep going. That's, you know, sleep is you sleep when you're dead and all this nonsense. There's there's this lack of respect for our bodies and our bodies are amazing. You know, m- modern medicine is amazing for acute things like heart attacks and things, but it's not very good for chronic stuff. You know, the stuff that doesn't really get a label, doesn't really get help. It's not very good for that. But the body is good at that. The body, the body's really good at self-healing when we give it time, when we give it respect. And I just feel we have this huge cultural distrust of the body, distrust of, you know, just listening to it. And it's very personal and it changes. So I think part of the problem as well is that the mind wants everything solved. So I know how to sleep. I know how to eat. I know how to organize my day in a way that works for me etc but then what happens is things shift so um, for example I've noticed a huge shift in all sorts of ways I want to do things with this season I don't know if I've just noticed it more this year because you know I've, I've embedded and I'm constantly practicing neutral noticing so I'm I'm moving through my day, learning to listen to my body more and more, learning to listen to my heart more and more, learning to control my attention more and more. So this practice of neutral noticing, it's it's been three years nearly for me. So it's just longer. And and when I say three years, I mean it's kind of developing three years ago. I don't think of I suppose it's different for me, isn't it? Because it's come out of me and my students. So I don't see it as a like I started it on this day and it was a thing. It, it's developed. It started developing over three years ago. And I can see where the roots of it came from. Like, you know, when I was one of my hacks, as it were, was to to practice mindfulness. So I remember walking across my classroom, feeling my feet on the ground, exhausted from just teaching an intense lesson and going to 
to open the door for the next 30 kids. And although I loved my job, I needed a break. And there is no break between lessons. And I desperately, desperately needed one. And every cell in my body was going, don't open that door. Don't open that door. And I swallowed down the tears and the, the need, the desperate crying, screaming inside my body for a break. I opened the door and smiled at every single child. It was exhausting. <laughs> oh, so difficult. And yeah, I don't know what you I don't know what you do with that. Well I do know what you do with it. I don't know what you do with the, the job. I'm glad not to be in it anymore. Um but I do know what you do. What I wasn't doing was bringing neutrality to my noticing. So I was noticing how awful I felt, but then I was getting caught up in how awful it was rather than just listening. Okay, so I need to make some changes or actually not even that because that's an action. For me, it's really important when you're noticing, when you're practicing neutral noticing. And if you haven't yet got the one minute mark, click in the show notes below and grab your free one minute audio, the one minute mark, which is my base. My When I say basic, I mean, it's the starter for neutral noticing, but people still use it. Like, so it's not the starter as in then you progress because we don't, it's the Zen thing of not progressing. It's always a practice. You always begin, you always bring a beginner's mind. So actually the one minute mark yes it's how you get started but it's also you could just stick with that it's I have to say I love the one minute mark and I it always feels a bit boasty to say that but it's a funny thing when you create something that it, it becomes um it has its own life so now I see it out in the world and people say oh I'm still using that and I love it and it's like it's separated from me and gone off across the globe to do its work and so I can now look at it and go yeah what I love about it and what I'm proud of about it is how well it I think it's amazing how it the words to it help you practice the very habits that need reversing um, the mind-based habits of judgment and always pushing yourself and always trying to control and achieve things it's all in the one minute mark miraculously to me because it wasn't a planned like it wasn't because it wasn't a mind-based creation so it, it didn't come from my mind thinking oh how can I fit all of these concepts in here it, it it arrived I recorded it and then I've studied it once it was recorded if you see what I mean it's funny isn't it I guess that's creativity for you um and I'm astounded at how well it works. So do grab your copy and give it a go. I'd love to know how you get on. Um, yes. So bringing the neutrality to mindfulness, the, the dropping of the judgment, the shoulds, the oughts, the this is terrible, this is good. And just noticing is very, very important. And if I'd known, it's always, isn't it? If I'd known then what I know now. But if I'd known then what I know now, things would have been very different. But I'm really glad they're not very different because I'm here talking to you. And this is really cool. And I love talking to you each week. So I have no problem with the fact that, yeah, on that day, years ago, I felt like I was breaking and I didn't know what to do about it. And I just swallowed it down, crushed my heart yeah, ignored my body and spent another few years trying to solve the problem with my mind. I'm fine with that because that leads me to do this work. So that's really cool. But for you, I don't want you having to do that. Man, no, let's do it differently. Let's make, let's make things easier for you. You know, let's shortcut, shortcut your route to creating a life that works for you, that you feel at ease in, that you feel at home in. So. How do we make the impossible possible? Well, I think first of all, you look at what you're trying to do and see that it's actually not possible either. Because if you're trying to squish yourself into, if you're trying to use your mind to squish yourself and change yourself into the life that you, you've created your life, right? I mean, you could have done things differently. Like you could have 
not worked so hard, not been so successful. You could have like not done any studying or exams or set up that business and pushed yourself out of your comfort zone and gone full on for achievement. You could have not gone to uni. You could have, there's so many things you could have chosen not to do. Like if you just wanted, if you actually, if you just wanted the life where you, if you take out the meaningful, satisfying work part of it and you just did something that enabled you to have enough money but you could forget about the work so you wouldn't probably wouldn't have as much money I mean I think this is part of the problem isn't it um but for example I've loved 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 I've done lots of jobs in my life and particularly in my 20s and 30s and there every job I did I loved until I didn't and then I moved on so I worked in cafes and all sorts of things and as long as I was loving it I was quite happy and I just look back at those days and remember the fact that I didn't think about work outside of work this wasn't relevant like who cares <laughs> you do your job and then you go home I mean I didn't have the money to do all of the things I wanted to do apart from my attitude that money wouldn't stop me so I still did a lot of things like taking my boys around the world backpacking and lots of crazy things but I'm really, I like money as well. I want it all. Money's great. I love money. Money's great fun, isn't it? It gives you all sorts of things, lovely things that you want. So, but if you, so you want meaningful, satisfying work, health and good relationships, but it always feels like you're struggling between the three. So if you go out, if you dare to like take your evening back and not just use it to kind of patch yourself up to go back into the fray the next day, um, if instead you decide, oh, I'm going to go out, I'm going to have some fun, I'm going to stay up a bit later, and then the next day you're a bit rubbish at work, then it's compromised your work instead. And if that doesn't work for you because you love doing a really good job, can you see there's like three things and it's always like one thing's out of sync. It doesn't matter what you do, something's always out of sync. So if then you use your mind to change yourself to make it work, or the other thing would be to get rid of the meaningful satisfying work downsize your lifestyle so that you can forget about work and then just live you know just like just take it easy expect less take it easy then you're still not getting what you want so it's it's possible it's like it's possible to have two out of three or one out of three but never all of it by squishing yourself by changing yourself by by adding constantly to this invisible get better at list it's not possible it's impo- that's what i'm arguing is that that is impossible that the route that you're going down now if that's what you're on that's actually not possible that's actually the impossible and what is possible is what your mind is telling you is impossible which is to have it all and i'm going to argue i am arguing all the time this is my core premise of everything i teach you can have it all but you need more skills because we live in an age where we overuse the mind and the mind isn't good at happiness and it does not have the capacity and the the information gathering possibility it just it's not on its radar to have what you want if you want what you want, which you do, and if you deny that, then you're back into trying to do the impossible because you just got rid of one of your things. Um, to have what you want, it is possible, but you need to look at things differently and to do things differently. And I would argue that that is based on noticing how often you're living in your head and making decisions from your mind and to start listening deeply to your heart. To literally, as Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. To pay attention because it matters. Because your heart has the answers that you seek. Quite literally. You have everything you need. It's inside of you. But we are so distracted by the external. And we are so fearful of the internal. We are so fearful of deeply held emotions that we crush them down. And yet there's the answers. And it doesn't have to be difficult because you go at your own pace and also you don't neutral noticing is brilliant because you don't have to the whole point is you don't act on it it's not about noticing and then making huge changes following your heart and then quitting your job like like I did um 
it doesn't have to be that 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 was a hard thing to do because then it just it destabilized everything it wasn't the answer it's what I did I'm not advocating it it's really tough so much um shame and lack of loss of confidence and sadness and grief over the loss of my career I mean and plus all the financial rubbish so really don't advocate that but I I don't as I said I don't regret it because it's got me here but for you if you want what feels impossible meaningful satisfying work health and great relationships to actually live in and enjoy the life you work so hard for then you've got to get out of your head got to learn to control your attention listen to your body your body can tell you so much magical stuff for getting more energy for letting go of hell patterns of tension and oh it's brilliant it's magical and listen to your heart and that is neutral noticing in a nutshell genius (laughs) so anyway i'm just saying for this, whether you decide to get the one minute mark and practice neutral noticing, that's up to you. But please, please, please consider the possibility that the impossible is possible and what you think is possible is a mind trick and it's actually impossible. I hope that my words resonate deeply and lift your day and fill your heart and yeah just give you more of your extraordinary life back because you matter how you are in the world matters and how you see the world and how you see and view the words possible and impossible matter because what the mind will tell you is impossible the heart and the body will just course correct that for you (laughs) and make it possible for you have an unexpectedly lovely week and i'll see you this time next week to find out more about my tiny huge life-changing practices please visit www.heidimark.co.uk